Welcome to Construction Genius, and my guest today is Jake Thompson. Jake is a leadership performance coach and the chief encouragement officer at Compete Every Day. Started his company in 2011 selling t-shirts out of the trunk of his car. And he's grown the business and had an impact on over 80,000 ambitious leaders, including folks with Bolt, Baker Concrete, and MW Builders, as well as working with a number of AGC state chapters. In this episode, we're going to cover why it's vital for leaders to take a genuine interest in their people, the difference between command and control leadership versus coaching and nurturing leadership, and when you need to use command and control leadership, transitioning from me to we, how to shift from being an individual contributor to a team leader, and the importance of coaching and mentoring during this transition. We're also going to dive into effective coaching conversations, how to prepare for them, how to conduct them, and what kind of questions you should be asking during a coaching conversation. And then we're going to be hitting on listening. Yes. How to become a more effective listening. L not a more effective listening. <laughs> how to become a more effective listener. How about how to become a more effective speaker? Um, in the listening part, it's going to be totally awesome because um, Jake is going to share some of his insights into listening more effectively. I'm going to share some of mine, and you'll get a real strong idea of how you can become a better listener as well. So let's dive into this great conversation about leadership, and I really appreciate you listening to Construction Genius today. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Jake, welcome to Construction Genius. Hey, happy to be here, Eric. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, we're going to have a deep dive today on the topic of leadership, so let's just get right into it. What is leadership? I truly believe that leadership is the ability to influence and develop people. Now, that doesn't always mean positive, but with regards to how you work and I work, it's how do we impact that positive leadership so that we're coaching and developing people into an upward direction versus not, because we know we've seen what bad leadership can do as well. What do you mean by influence? Influence, really, it's the ability to inspire, direct I was telling a group of construction executives yesterday with the North Texas Construction Association that there's a lot of have to follow individuals. And then there's the people that others want to or get to follow. And really, it's the idea that you have to, you follow somebody because of where they sit on the org chart. And you may or may not consider them a leader, whether that's an accurate use of the description of somebody you would willingly follow, but I see leader as someone you would willingly want to get to follow because they have a genuine interest in your success. They're capable in their work. They're competent in what they do, and they are willing to inspire you to do better and do more within a team context or perhaps outside of it. Interesting, because you talked about the qualities of the people that someone would want to follow. The first one you mentioned was a genuine interest. Why do you think it's important for leaders to take a genuine interest in their people? Yeah, as we briefly teased offline, right? The old school way is the guy in the back with the bullwhip. It's I'm going to yell at you. You're going to listen to me. You're going to do exactly what I say all the time. I don't need to know you. I don't need to care about you. It's my way or the highway. And that is traditionally a lot of the work in our not only our industry, but a number of other industries. And the world has changed quite a bit. We know right now there's such a fight for talent. Like we want high performers. We want good people on our team. And so, so does everyone else. And at times there feels like there's a fight because there's a shortage of good talent. And so when you have that, if you're good talent, if you're a high performer, if you're a little bit ambitious, maybe raw on some skills, but you're ambitious and want to get better, you can be a little more picky about where you work than you could 10, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, especially with everyone fighting for top talent. So when you think about that, what are the types of environments you want to be in? Well, you want to be in an environment where you feel part of a team where you're getting feedback on where you can improve and there's an opportunity to grow. And so that all stems from the leaders taking a genuine interest in getting to know their people. Because what I believe is, is you can bullwhip somebody into submission mm -hmm. or you can 
coach and coax them into this is why this is the right way. This is how we're going to do it together. And fundamentally, it all starts with relationships and building that trust. Let's think about that a little bit more. Why do you think that change has occurred? You, you mentioned one reason that you know there's a labor shortage and therefore the employees have, so to speak, more leverage than they did in the past. Are there any other reasons why that shift has occurred that perhaps are linked to the culture? I would say the culture and the turnover is a big one, right? You, it's only so long you're just going to get yelled at before you either well, become no, 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 completely no, no. I apathetic. Meant, I meant the oh. societal culture. I, I'm not talking oh. so much, because I'd like to get a little deeper into this, because I have some theories on this. I want to see what, what your theories are. Why is it that the sort of command and control style of leadership that is so prevalent in construction, why is that not working as well as it used to? from a cultural perspective, a little deeper than just, you know, the company perspective? Yeah. So culturally across the board, I think there may be a few reasons. One, we are starting to see and have seen more and more research in multiple industries, how that burns people out much quicker. So across the board, there's more conversations around, hey, this old school style may not actually be the most productive way from a long-term cultural standpoint. I think another one is we're a lot more aware of what other work environments are than we were 20, 30 years ago. You look at this little device here right. and you can access people all over the world and you can see, and that guy over there and that company, they love going to work. Sure. I hate going to the job site, I hate doing this. And so our awareness that there's actually more opportunities as we become more connected socially, digitally, technologically, that I don't necessarily have to stay in an abusive environment as I once did because I needed the pay. I can look for other opportunities that a few decades ago, that wasn't even an option and you weren't even aware that was an option. This was the job and this is what you're doing. Okay, so that's interesting. What are your thoughts I, I, on that? Yeah, no, I like that take about you know the, the fact that we can see the broader world. Um, you think about the way that a lot of focus has been made on you know great places to work over the years, how tech companies have these cultures where you know they demand high performance, but at the same time, they give you a lot of benefits. So here's part of my theory. Let me bounce it off of you and yep. see what you think. The last time we fought a societal war, all-out war, that ended 80 years ago in 1945. So if you think about it, and we're talking about American culture here, you know, you could apply this obviously to, to Europe. You know, for the first half of the 20th century, we were basically at war. And particularly between 41 and 45 in America, we were at all out war, societal. And so that military style was something that pervaded throughout society. And people were coming back from the war, coming into companies, and they were familiar with that top down command and control style. And it also works very well on a construction site where things have to be done on deadlines and they have to be done in a certain manner. So my theory is that because we haven't fought a war, an all-out war, for 80 years, our culture has changed. And so it's changed from the masculine emphasis of war to the more feminine nurturing emphasis. And that's why there is a, a reluctance of people, particularly young people, to submit, so to speak, to a command and control environment because they're not used to it. And that's why there's a shift that needs to happen in the mindset of leaders so that they can understand that they need to go from more command and control to more of a coaching environment, like you mentioned earlier. So let me get that's your thoughts a, on that. That's a fascinating. No, I, yeah. that's a fascinating way to think about it. I have my thoughts on what the fact that my generation has never had to consider or worry about being drafted or deal with a major world war has done from a mental toughness standpoint. And we had the whole conversation yesterday on participation trophies and everything else. And so I, I very much stand in, in one field on that. But I also, to a degree, would agree with that. But yeah. I, I think the challenge is there's a time and a place for both. When you're on the job site and you're mm -hmm. dealing with heavy, like command and control in that moment saves people's lives. And so being a, but here's the thing, if you're doing that 24 seven, you burn everybody out. Mm -hmm. It's like the coach who just constantly rails that. Had a chance to interview our show, the former strength coach for USC Trojans and then Seattle Seahawks. He was with mm -hmm. Pete Carroll for almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And he talked about he was the old school football coach that would berate you. Chris was like, I would yell at you. I was that guy. And then he had an accident and he wasn't able to use his voice for like two months. He had to whisper. And he said he learned in that moment that it wasn't the shouting, yelling, 
at guys that got their attention, it was the commanding respect because he suddenly had to learn to wisp and talk and treat them and teach them differently. And he said that opened his eyes to how it is. And so to your point, I think it's the old, and here's the other thing. We have a large in our leaders within, we'll talk construction, right? We have a whole lot of people in that silver wave that are going to retire in the next five to 10 years. Yep. And we probably, most organizations have a 10, 15 year gap before that next line of leaders. So which is two different worldviews growing up. But the problem is you've got an older group that's 24 seven with the command and control and the younger group who's seen it and they either are like, okay, this is the only way to do it or I'm going to go the complete opposite end versus understanding command and control is very situational. A football coach is a command and control in certain moments of the game, but in other areas, they're coaching, they're practicing, they're asking questions. And so I think it's our ability to navigate both of those worlds, especially when you get into the executives that I know you do work with, is you got to speak to both groups. And so you got to be able to say these are situational skill sets that a leader needs to be able to know when to pull and when to push. All right. So I like that a lot. I think that's a very good distinction that you made there because some people may listen to this and, you know, think, dude, sometimes you got to say to someone, stop. And so you made that distinction very clearly. I like that a lot. So there is such, and this is the thing that's tough for us, right? Because depending on your character, you know, the way that you behave, being flexible in that way can be a challenge. So let me ask you, what, why is it that people are challenged to be flexible? What, what, what hinders someone from sort of being that full spectrum leader, you could say? Uh, I would say there's a lot of things. One, they haven't been taught it. Leadership mm -hmm. is a skill like most everything else, right? We are only aware of what we've been exposed to or experienced. And what we have is no different than a alcoholic family cycle, right? The dad's an alcoholic or mom's an alcoholic, kid becomes alcoholic, grandkid. Like it just continues that cycle until someone says, done, I'm done, I'm out, I'm changing it. This is what I've seen. This is what I don't want. And so we're used to it. I think that's one regard. I think if you're familiar with Carol Dweck's work on fixed mindset and growth mindset, I think it's the belief system that, we have a lot of fixed mindset areas. Well, this is just the way I am and this is the way I'll always be. Right. Versus open to the idea of what's the best way? What's my way, but what's the best way? And looking for what's the best for our team and our organization. And so that's a whole educational process there. And then finally, it's the training. We might do a little bit of training on, hey, you just got promoted. Here's your new role. Here's your new task. But we don't teach people on how to coach. And really, when you get promoted, you're going into management, which is task-focused projects. Leadership is people-focused. And it's learning to ask and develop questions and ask people and help them grow. And so we don't do that. And so we really struggle with that flexibility. I would say the wild card in all this is, is part of where my book start, my latest book starts on this is you got to know the people before you can be flexible with them. Because if you're flexible, if you're bouncing back and forth, but you don't know your people and how they respond, you're going to have a hard time. Because to your point, some of our guys, like my coaches in sports growing up knew, like, if we want the bet, we're going to challenge Jake. We're going to talk about the guy who's at his position. We're going to say something about him being undersized. Like, we know that's going to light that fire underneath him. Versus other guys, you can't play that card. They'll shut down. But they knew that from knowing the players and then doing it kind of that way. And so for us... Just because we work with a guy doesn't mean we know him. And, and I laughed about this yesterday. I said, how many of us have worked with people for a year, two years, 10 years? We couldn't tell you if they have kids. We couldn't tell you if they're a dog or a cat person. We couldn't tell you anything other than because we were in Dallas. Maybe they like the Cowboys, but here's the email or here's the project they're behind on and here's where they messed up. We can tell you that in a split second, but we don't know anything about them. And if we don't know them, we're not going to know which levers to push when we need to get the right output from them. Okay. So I think one thing that, that's really interesting and, and perhaps a little mental game that you could play with yourself is going back to the uh, strength coach you're talking about, sort of play a what if game. What if I didn't have that loud voice? What would change? What if all I could do is have difficult conversations and confront people and that's all I could do? I had no other choice but to be confrontational. How would that change? You know, for someone perhaps who has difficulty having those conversations. But I'd like to go to this idea of coaching because I, I do think that that's one of the things in, in our culture that people are familiar with, right? Generally speaking, people in, in America, you know, we're all into sports to one degree or another. We've played sports at one level or another. So we're familiar with the idea of being coached. Now we may have bad coaches, good coaches. So let's explore that a little bit. If I'm going to step into leadership and I'm no longer building a project, but I'm building a team of people, and so I have to make that shift 
from being a technical construction person to being a builder of teams. Let me just first start with a definition. What is coaching? I think it's the development of people. It's bringing okay. out, it's helping a skill set improve. It's getting the best out of others. More than anything, if you were to sum it in one word, it's teacher. I think a leader is a coach and a coach is a teacher. A leader is a coach and a coach is a teacher. You think about okay. the sports coaches you mentioned, right? They're teaching guys how to, and girls, how, how do you play basketball better? What's the play? How do we read a defense? But they're also more so these days, more collaborative. What do you think we should do? We're empowering. Steve Kerr is a phenomenal example, almost in your backyard there with the Golden State Warriors of mm -hmm. what they built over the last decade, teaching, but also empowering them to execute versus, we'll say Bobby Knight, old school style. Right. Of the command and control. Let me ask you about that real quick. Yeah. So this is interesting. You bring up yeah. Steve Kerr. And so the first person that pops into my head is not Stephen Curry, but it's Draymond Green, right? Draymond. All right. So now Draymond obviously is a really good basketball player. And he seems to be like a good guy in many ways. But then he has that sort of, you know, like many of us do, we lose it, right? Yep. And so what do you do when you have a guy like Draymond Green on your team who punches his teammates, gets thrown out of games, may have lost you a championship? in one particular incident, I think a few years ago. Yeah, oh, very much. I think that cost them the championship. You know, what's interesting about that situation is think about who Kerr played under toward the end of his career. Phil Jackson. Right. Dennis Rodman. Right. He saw a lot of this firsthand. Right. What's interesting, and, and here's kind of the difference, I say, in, in sports versus life, right? Sports have a season and an off season, and then they're done. Right. Like they're they're buying into... Hey, we're going to chase the championship for seven months, six months, and then you're off doing your own thing for a while. Yes, we're a team. Yes, we're buying into it versus we're with each other every single day of the week. And for a difference of like, if we finish a project, you're not getting a championship ring. So there's a little bit from the motivation output standpoint. So I think in sports, and you see it time and time again, groups are a lot more lenient with the most talented player. Right. However, I'm actually shocked. Draymond is still with the team. Yeah. I've actually been very surprised that Clay was the first to leave versus Draymond simply because of what you said, because of that issue. Now, what I think in that situation is Kerr may look at himself as a father figure. Right. And I need to grow and develop and he's part of our culture. And I think Draymond truly is their culture. Steph may be the face, but Draymond is a lot of that, but there's good and bad. And we've seen it cost them a championship. And if they didn't get rid of him right then, then there's something else behind the scenes he's doing that we haven't fully seen. When it comes to the job site, though, allowing those troublesome people, no matter how much of a high performer they are, will eventually sink your culture. Because what will happen is Steph Curry leaves the Warriors because he's tired of losing games because Draymond can't keep his cool. Right. Or because of an issue. That's what's going to happen in the workplace. And that's what we see time and time again is, is your best people understand, well, if that person gets by, I don't want to keep dealing with this. This isn't a place where standards and excellence are really upheld. I'm out. And so you lose that, which is why sales teams that keep their highest salesperson, even though they're kind of a crook and they skate by and everything else, ultimately end up sinking their culture in the long run because of that individual. And we see that toxic individual. And once you start to lose one or two high performers, you're going to lose more because that's going to set the tone of, yeah, this isn't a place if you actually don't want to do great work. It's interesting because it's really easy for us in this conversation and particularly in the roles that we play and the people that we work with, where we're, you know, we're coming from the outside and saying, this guy's not a cultural fit. You should get rid of him. Or we may not tell people to do that, but we yep. may have conversations like that. And then someone looks at us and, and they say, you know, Eric, that's easy for you to say, but this guy is, he makes me money, right? Yep. And let's say you get this technically skilled guy, maybe it's an operator who's a total jerk, but the CEO or the president or the, you know, the general superintendent or the foreman, they're willing to, so to speak, put a little cordon around them, you know, a little box around them. They're willing to put them over here and try and mitigate against that simply because that kind of talent is not available. And this person is making them so much money that they make the cost benefit analysis between the money that they make and the cultural impact. And they figure, you know what, I'm going to mitigate against this cultural impact because I still want this person to make money. So let's say you're having a conversation with someone yeah. like that 
and you're making a, you know, you're, you're saying it's going to sink your culture. And the guy's like, well, no, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think I can manage it. What would you say to them? I would say, well, first question is, why do you think that? How many people have you lost in the last six to eight months that would be attributed to those relationships? Because sure. you may watch them walking out the door and think, okay, well, we can replace them because they're not as skilled as this person. But the money he's making you is suddenly now going to recruiting, training, onboarding mm -hmm. new employees. And we know an employee's cost it can be 15 to 20% of their annual salary. That starts to stack when one person becomes one of the reasons a lot of people start leaving. And so even though you're looking at how much money they're making you at the same time, their impact could be losing you. The other instance is if everyone on your team behaved the same way this person did, would you even want to be here? Right. I like guess the executive, like if you had a team full of this person, would you want to deal with it? They probably say no. And so then my question is, we want to look at a non-business example. If you look at a similar instance in sports, those top talents wear themselves out in two to three years because of the culture and the setup. Terrell Owens, one of the most talented receivers in NFL history, didn't make it very long in each place. Right. Dominated when he was there, but eventually at the end, it was a disaster. You would just see that move every time. And so I think a lot of times we overlook or willing to overlook the faults because of the bottom line. Oh, well, they're just making us more money right. in the now. And we fail to realize what would happen if we extrapolate this out over the next three to five years. Right. And by the time we get to that point, and you know this from seeing it firsthand, right? Once your culture starts to go, it's not like an overnight shift back. You have to rebuild trust. You have to rebuild everything once it's destroyed. And that takes time. Okay. So let's go back to this idea of coaching then, because it's, everyone's nodding their head. I, I understand that. Yeah. And maybe some of us have been coaches, you know, I mean, I've coached my kids' teams. I don't know if you've coached your kids' teams, but you, you know, so we've all done that, but we're talking about adults here, right? We're not talking about children, thankfully, because maybe adults are easier to coach than kids. <laughs> depending. <laughs> depending, huh? You know who the worst are, right? It's it's us, the parents. The parents That's are the right. worst, right? It's like, can I just, it's, it's so funny. I'll just let's sidetrack here. In America, right, we get sold this idea of, I don't know what it is, of like D1 sports or, or professional sports. And, you know, I remember this one guy came up to me, right, when, when my son was playing baseball. He says, your, your son could be a professional. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no clue what you're talking about, right? And so that's just a shout out to the parents there. If you're getting sold a bill of goods that your kid can be a professional, you're probably incorrect, right? Yep. And you're just spending money. Um, now, if you want to do it and you like doing it, that's great. But really, friends, we need to be realistic about that kind of thing. I saw a stat today that said it was like the last decade or two decades. And it was, what's the best college to go to if you want to make it pro in the NBA? And it was like the number one above all of them was have a parent who played pro basketball. Yeah, right. So then, you know, OK, OK, there's a better chance. But yeah, I mean, there's every kid here in DFW. They're fighting every weekend. They're traveling, as we laughed about, all over the state, all over the country playing for that shot. And the statistics are not there. They're and not. So to the point of we talked about at the very beginning to show the mental toughness, things like that, like why switch teams when your kid doesn't win the starting position? Force them to earn it. Like yeah, all of those things bleed over late in life, and so that, yeah, that's I, cool. I could get on that so books. So no, that's good, good, good. Up. No, it's good. Let, let's go back to this idea of coaching, though. Okay, so because I think one of the things to think about is, and I'd like to ask you, what is the structure of an effective coaching conversation? How do I structure that? So here, I love this because what I think a lot of times is we pair them with our management, our one-on-one -on -one meetings, and so want to step back and say, your how you manage someone that one-on-one -on -one should be separate than your coaching. Your management meeting, somebody might come out of that feeling like, crap, I got to set my game up. I'm not doing as well because we're reviewing. What are you on time with? What are you delivering? Yeah. Where are you hitting? It's all the tasks we're in. Yeah, yeah. We also, as the leader, should set the agenda for that. We're going to review these numbers. Here's where I see holes. Here's what mm -hmm. I want to discuss. I want to know why you're doing things, but like, I'm going to lead this. A coaching meeting a lot of times is what do you think you need to get better at? Here's the sheet. We actually put a, a worksheet in my book of like, here's a management meeting. But here's a coaching meeting that the person you're coaching should have this filled out to you before the meeting of here's what I want to work on. Here's where I don't think I understand right. Here's where I want to get better. And then we coach them and ask them questions through that process. Now, sometimes people don't know where they want to get better. And so right. that's our job to step in and say, here's where I see opportunities 
based on where you want to go in your career, you may just want to stay at the foreman level. You may want to grow and get all the way up in the company. So based on what you want to do, which goes back to how well do we know our people and what they're trying to achieve, then we start to direct that. And a lot of people are overwhelmed by this idea of, I don't know how to coach. And I laugh that it's really about being just a few steps ahead and being able to ask really good questions. Okay. So let's, let's yeah. stop right there. Yeah. Because I think one of the difficulties that people have is asking really good questions. So talk about that a little bit, Jake. What constitutes a really good question? Yeah. So there's actually the book I'm going to go back to that I think is simple, easy blueprint is The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay-Stein. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple, straightforward. I've given it to a ton of my executive coaching clients. I've given it to other clients because Michael does a phenomenal job of giving you the questions. Like, what do you want to work on? What's on your mind? But here's the key. Well, what do I ask after that? Well, what else? You start to pull follow-up questions. And here's the really cool part about this process that most people don't understand. Harvard ran a study years ago trying to understand ways or reasons we communicate. And what they found is overall, there's two main reasons we communicate. It's to learn information and to increase our likability. We want to get people to like us more, right? National human tendency. We want to be liked, appreciated, accepted. Mm -hmm. And what they found is the way you increase likability is to ask follow-up questions. Right. Because it shows an interest in them and wanting to get to know them. And when you think about it, a lot of times, like we come into this idea of coach, I've got to look like I have to be the most interesting. I have to be the most accomplished. You have to be the most interested. You got to be able to ask questions. And Okay. So one of the first ones I love is, is the what, why, how, like what, what is my role? How do I succeed in it? Right. Every one of our team members, employees should know this. How do, how do I not get fired? The other two are the ones where you can really start to differentiate yourself as a leader is why does the work I do matter to the team's success? I'm not just welding something. I'm not just doing, you know, screwing this in. Here's why what you do impacts the team and what we're trying to achieve. And then the last question is typically the scariest one. How does what I do today help me get to where I want to go? And this one can really direct coaching conversations and deeper dives of what skills do you need to develop. But sometimes we're scared to ask this question because, man, the PM we're about to ask this to doesn't actually want to be here. He wants to start his own thing in a few years. And so that can create fear in us of well, why am I going to coach and develop this person if he's going to leave us? Right. And then you throw in the old, I guess it was Steve Jobs quote of what if you don't develop the person and they stay? Right. Like it's worse for the culture. And so I always look at it of, man, if you become a culture and a leader who develops people and some of your people decide to leave and some people do something else, but you're known as the place of they're going to take care of you, they're going to develop you. They're going to make you better. The people that left actually become some of your best recruiters because they're going to know like that's a place you can work and grow. Hey, this is Eric, and I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Jake. Quick break to remind you about my book, Construction Genius. Effective, hands-on, practical, simple, no BS leadership strategy and sales advice for construction companies. Go out to Amazon, buy the book. It's 19 bucks, 20 bucks, excuse me, 20 bucks a copy. And uh, it's totally awesome. You're going to really like it. Five-star reviews are all over the place on Amazon, and you can read those and get a sense of why you should read the book. And um, now let's get back to the conversation with Jake. So it's interesting because you rightly have this idea of these open-ended questions, which I think is it's a lot more difficult than people think actually to ask an open-ended question because we we tend to be we tend to be very good at asking yes no questions and one thing that you have to be able to do as a leader by the way is to interrupt yourself as you're asking a question and say hold on a minute you know if you're about to say I ask a yes or no question you got to interrupt yourself and reframe yep. it now it's like playing a game of tennis right you hmm. want to ask something that they can hit back that you yes. can follow up and hit back again yeah, there you go. That's a good one. Now, now this is one thing that I found very helpful. And this is particularly true when you're having a maybe a difficult conversation. And that is to ask the natural question. And what I mean by that is that as you're having a conversation with someone, you're obviously having, you're also having a conversation with yourself. There's a dialogue going on in your mind and you're making connections with what they're saying with other things that are perhaps related to them. And when that happens, you often get a question pop into your head that's maybe not on your list and you're thinking, hmm, should I ask that question? And it's often the question where you may find some resistance in yourself. 
not wanting to ask that question because maybe it is one of those difficult or challenging questions. It's the natural question. And one thing that you should be doing as a leader is making sure in your one-on-one -on -one meetings, as you're describing, Jake, that you're asking those natural questions, the ones that just pop into your head. What are your thoughts on that? So one, I love that. Absolutely love that. Because if you think about the uncomfortable questions, typically lead to the stronger relationship through conversation. Mm -hmm. Think about any, you know, your uh, marriage, right? Or a conversation with a kid. Like usually it's the ones that, like, I don't really want to have this, but like this is best for the whole relationship are the ones you should have. Yep. The other thing that you said there that I don't want anybody listening to miss is you talked about looking at your questions. And I think that goes to being prepared before the meeting starts Right. of what do we want to talk, like where are we focused? They're going to come in with, here's where I think I need to be coached. Here's where I think I need to get better. But I want to have questions prepped because as my uh, mentor, Phil Jones, always says, the worst time to think about what you're going to say is right before you're going to say it. Sure. And so having those notes ahead of time for every meeting not only makes them run more smoothly, but I think that's really important. And so to your point, having the scripted questions allows you to kind of work in a direction that you intentionally want it to go. But when you feel that this may be a thread I need to pull on, it's no different than a podcast conversation. We talked offline. Okay, here's some things we're going to talk through. And as I laughed, I was like, you hear something, let's go in that direction. Because that's typically where you get better dialogue, you start to learn more. And as a leader, if you can go into those conversations with just curiosity, how can I help? What can I learn? How do we walk out of here better? And you have this sense of curiosity going into those coaching meetings versus a management meeting of like, here's where we're missing the mark. What's the game plan on how we improve? Yeah. Where do we need to step it up? You walk away where you're probably going to learn as much in that process as they are, which is really beneficial for the, the culture overall too. It's interesting because um, going back to this idea of you know, we talked earlier about how at times you, you have to have command and control. At times you have to have coaching. It's also one of the strong parts of leadership is at times you have to be structured in the way that you have those co coaching conversations. And at times you have to improvise. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, playing a musical instrument. You know, as you learn a piece of music, as you're first learning it, you want to learn it note by note by note. But then once you've got it down note by note, then you have the power to be able to improvise off of that and perhaps do something a little more interesting with it. And the same is true with these leadership conversations. You might start off, you know, as you're promoted into a place of leadership and have these kind of structured conversations and they may feel a little rigid, but the more comfortable you get, the more reps you get, then you have that opportunity to improvise. Absolutely. It's, it's no different than when your favorite NFL quarterback drops back to pass and the play does not go according to plan. The only reason they can adjust and have success is because they know the play. They've repped the play. They've got it in their bones. They know where everybody is. And now they're just making an adjustment and improving on the fly because they know everything else and they're comfortable with it. And I think that's one thing that probably stops most of us from getting into these coaching situations is that it's going to be clunky at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But to your point, it's just like a musical instrument. It's only by putting in the reps and being intentional and practicing it that you get better about it. And if we get into that idea of how do I just get better versus, man, I got to be perfect from day one. Right, right. It changes the whole thing. Because I, and I would say this from just a general leadership standpoint, to start our conversation. Every one of us listening wants the people on our team to do better work one month, six months, one year from now. No yeah. question. I've never had somebody say, no, I, I want everybody to do better. What are we doing to model that growth and improvement ourselves by putting in that work? Because it just doesn't naturally happen. Improvement requires intentionality. And so this is a, a beautiful example to say, hey, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this as well. And what I'm doing it is I'm doing it because I want to help you get better. I want to help our culture. I want to see you grow and thrive. And it may be a little clunky, but if you'll work with this through me, we're both going to get better in the process. And over that time period, you're modeling the behavior of growth that you want your team to exhibit while also getting better yourself. Okay, so I like that. I want to go back into the coaching conversation and yeah. I, I want to focus on listening. Okay. For most people, listening is a tremendous challenge. We are not good listeners. So what is good listening and how do I get better at listening? Better through reps, but it's active engagement in the conversation. It's shutting off your cell phone. It's turning off the notifications. It's giving someone that direct attention. It's when you start to get that feel of, Oop, I need to respond to this. Oop, I need to respond to this to silence it, mm -hmm. let it sit. 
because you want to be engaged. You don't want to be waiting to say the next thing because you won't remember what they said. Right. You want to be actively listening and processing what they say, chewing on it and then responding. I think the best thing is having a pause before you ever respond to someone to have the time to digest what they said and then go along. It's helpful sometimes to not give them a verbal or a nonverbal cue that you're hearing what they're saying without interrupting them. Um, but it's more than anything, it's being in that moment and fully hearing what they say versus just waiting to speak. And that is a, a no different than any other skill. It's one that takes time to learn and develop, especially as quickly as our attention can jump place to place. And I'm a kid with ADHD, so like I know how it means to get a little restless. But the better we become at listening, the better influence we're also going to build with that person because they're going to feel heard, feel appreciated because we're giving them our time versus we've all had the conversation where somebody's, they're on their cell phone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I got you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, they're not really listening to you, which makes you feel less important to them. And so I think that's a really big key of this process. Um. What physical cues, if any, do you give yourself to help to bring you back into a conversation when you begin to feel yourself drifting off? Yeah, so I, I have that happen. So funny enough, I always wear one of our Compete Everyday wristbands. I'm 24-7, as my wife would laugh. But I literally will have it and just kind of catch it with my thumb. Like mm -hmm. I'll have my hands crossed and I'll catch it when I feel my thoughts going because it's a physical cue of back to this moment as well as feeling almost that rubber band snap into your wrist. Um, so that's a big one for me. The other is internally, we're all talking to ourselves. Whether you right. think you talk to yourself or you don't, you're talking to yourself. Yep. And so for me, when I catch the thoughts going, it's a simple, hey, pull back. Like just pull back, be in the present of, oh, I'm thinking about X, Y. No, no, no. Be here. Be here right now. And so I do those kind of two cues to help me mentally and physically be back in that moment. The other thing that's helpful sometimes is just taking notes. Yes. And you may think, well, this isn't a note taking type of conversation. Yeah. But it's sometimes helpful to take notes to be locked into that present moment yep. because you can only do the two things at once, right? You can only write and listen. Yep. You can write and think. You can listen and think, right? But you're going to have a hard time doing all three. You can't write, listen, and think your own separate thoughts. So yes. writing those notes down help you stay in that moment as well. Yeah, no, I like that. It's interesting because I, I, what I do when I, when I'm drifting out of a conversation is I ball up the toes on my right foot, and I say to myself, "Ground yourself," right. And so it's similar to what you were talking about. You're snapping your wrist, your wristband, and then you're, you have a little verbal cue as well. The taking notes, I think, is really important because that's where you can be writing questions down. You can be making sure that you're, you're getting all of the details. Then you can be feeding things back to people as well, making sure that you've heard things correctly. So that can be a tremendous tool to keep yourself in the conversation. Well, that also, not only that, but that adds into the additional piece for accountability of instead of just coaching, talking through things, okay, they're going to go work on this. I'm making notes of specifics in the conversation that I can make a drop into a week from now. Hey, How's that thing? Hey, I remember you mentioned at the beginning of our coaching call, you were headed to your kid's baseball game. How'd they do this weekend? Right. Like little notes like that allow you to strengthen relationships versus trying to keep it all up top. And so I had a coaching client in a different industry that when he started, he had 50 team members. He spent 10 minutes every day having a cup of coffee with a different person. Yep. And it was no work. He just wanted to get to know him. And yep. then he would track everything in a Google document. Yeah, everything, kids' names, all of it, and then would just reference back to it. He could reference it before he had a meeting with someone, yeah. or he could just do it throughout the week and say, who do I need to check in on? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. It's funny, and because people might think, oh, I'm being fake then if I'm doing all of that yeah. note-taking and stuff like that. That's not fake at all. That's just, you know, that's being effective. <laughs> Dude, I have everybody's birthdays in my calendar, like coworkers, clients, all of that, and I have my calendar set up to give me a week out alert. So I can send a birthday card or make sure I send them a note. It's over the top, but I have, I'm not going to remember all of it. So yep. how do I make sure I keep track of this stuff? The goal isn't, is more than anything. How do you make it easy to continue making drops and deposits into relationships? Yeah. And writing stuff down and alerts is the best way. Let me go back to this idea of, yeah. um, you know, I think one thing that we're teasing out here is that when you get promoted, you need to be a little bit patient with yourself. 
because things are going to feel awkward. You may be, you know, very effective at the technical aspects of your business, but you know, the people stuff is is difficult. It's complex. It takes time. Um, let's let's go to the perspective of the some someone who is just promoted. Let's say I'm a you know, let's say I'm an operations manager and I, or let's say I'm the CEO and I've just promoted someone into project executive and now they have four or five project managers re I'm reporting to them. What do I need to do in the first 90 days to set up that person for success who's been newly promoted into a leadership role that they're not familiar with? Yeah, I would spend a lot of time coaching and mentoring them on tips for success. Hey, where on your calendar are you spending time getting to know your people? Talk to me about your morning habits and routines. Talk to me about what you're most anxious about in this new role. What you want to do is how can I, no different than a coach who just had the starting quarterback get hurt and the backup stepping in, Right. coach is going to do everything to set that person up for success. And especially that individual that's going from a role of my success is determined by me to now my success is determined by we and other people determine how well I do. They're going to need that support as well as that patience to say, hey, listen, I don't expect you to be perfect from day one. Uh, this is a great opportunity for a CEO to show a little bit of vulnerability of, hey, when I was promoted, here's a mistake I made. Like right. When they mess something up, sharing what you went through is a really big one there. I had a, a, a client years ago now as a, a friend, their company got acquired. And so he got brought in with this new ownership team about a few months ago. And they called and they said, hey, come down to our offices. We want to do a meeting. He said, what should I prep? And this was Friday afternoon for Monday. And they're like, nothing, just know your people. And he has like 75 people underneath him. And so he gets down to the office and this new ownership group throws him his org chart and said, tell us about your people. And he walked through and will tell you about, hey, this one, she's got two kids. This is how long she's been with this. This is what she does. This guy over here. And he crushed it. And I said, what did that say to you? And he said, one, it told me how much they care about me, making sure I know and care about my people, right. which tells me the executive team cares about my success. And they want everybody to feel part of that. And so doing that, making sure your people know that success, quizzing them, helping them, coaching them, mentoring, but understanding, understanding where their fears are in this new role. Everybody gets anxious about a new role. What's you don't know what you don't know, but there's things that you don't know that you're worried about. Find out what they are, set them up for success, and then have that patience to say, I don't need you to be perfect in the fourth, first quarter. I need you to throw a touchdown in the third and fourth. And the way right. we're going to do that is we're going to work through this process together. It may feel like in the beginning, I'm, I'm micromanaging a little bit of the process with you because I'm checking in a lot. But what I'm doing is making sure you're set up so that as I pull away, there's zero doubt that you're set up for success and you're not worried about executing because I have the full faith in you. Okay. So then um, let's get, you, you went to that, that you mentioned this idea of shifting from me to we. And I think one of the reasons why people struggle with that is because when they're, let's say they're, they go from foreman to superintendent, for instance, as a foreman, I'm probably working with my guys every day. I'm seeing the production that we're getting. I'm getting a, a sense and a feel of accomplishment every day. And then I move to superintendent and I no longer have that sense of accomplishment. And sometimes I feel like I'm not working. And so I feel guilty sometimes. And I also then tend to want to get that feeling of work. And so I then micromanage people. And this can happen in a variety of different ways. So how do you help someone go through that transition where they don't feel like they're working anymore? When in fact, they actually are if they're focused on their responsibilities as a leader. Boy, that's a tough one, right? That's something business owners feel with all the time of working on the business versus in the business, right? Yeah. You get in the business because you feel like you feel it in your hands. I'm doing stuff. I'm a comp versus on the business sometimes isn't. So a lot of that question comes down to what are you asking the coaching questions? What do you feel your responsibilities and roles are at this new level? Where do you feel like you're not meeting those? Where do you feel a lack of work. And some of that is simply increasing not the management, but the touch points and communication with your team to be proud of what they're doing. It's no different than a, a player making the transition to coach. It's hard to go from the spotlight and being on the field playing the game to helping others play the game better. And every person struggles with this. So knowing it is natural, but what you should take pride in and what you should start looking and reevaluating your level of success is not, can I do the work with them? 
but how well can they do the work and how much better can I help them get at it? Yeah. Are they doing the work better a month and a taking pride in seeing someone else's growth? Probably no different than, than you did with kids, right? They started out swinging a baseball bat and then you're probably in the backyard throwing pitches with them all day and they start to hit a little bit better. You're not swinging the bat. They're doing the work, but you start to take pride in seeing their growth. And it's that same transition and mentality you have to take on of helping develop others. Because here's the cool part that a lot of people struggle with making that shift is if as long as I keep doing it, I still have importance. I'm still valuable. I can't be replaced. Right. Right. That's one reason we micromanage is because I can do it better and they can't replace me. Right. What people fail to realize is if you're someone who can actually get other people to do good work and continue to grow it, there's always a place for you. Even as your people grow up underneath you, you're not being replaced because every organization in America, regardless of the industry, wants people who can coach, manage, and grow people to develop, and they'll find a place for them because you will always have people that you can try to coach and develop up. And so I would say getting that shift of what do you think, you know, better understanding your role, asking those questions, and then encouraging them in the fact of like, hey, watch their growth. Their growth tells us that you're succeeding in this new role. It's interesting because I think one of the ways that you can make this shift is to use that sporting analogy. Because, you know, we've all, not all of us, but many of us have coached our kids' teams. And, you know, sometimes we wish we could run on the field, but that ain't happening. So what if you did a little mental exercise? What if I couldn't go out to the job site and have the difficult conversation with the subcontractor who's blowing it? What if I wasn't able to have that conversation with the client who is not paying the change order who is fighting me? What if I couldn't do that and they had to do it? What would that change about my leadership? I love that how you frame that because it forces you to say, if I couldn't go to the job site and talk to that subcontractor, who would I send? I don't know any of my guys I would trust to have that conversation. That's a red flag. Okay, I need to coach my guys on how to do this. And that reveals where the actual work comes in. And so I love I love how you phrase that because it really does start to identify the work you should be doing over micromanaging the on-site. Excellent, excellent. So Jake, I mean, I know we could go all day here, but t- tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell, tell us about who you work with and, and how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, easily. So I, I am a leadership performance speaker and coach. I do a ton of work in our construction industry. I've worked with AGC chapters, uh, state chapters all over the U.S., the Executive Council, uh, worked with MW Builders, Bolt, Millbank, Hilti, you name it, guys in construction, manufacturing all over around leadership development. Best way to connect with me, my website, jakeathompson.com. You can learn more about our programs. We're all about how do we get better about competing internally with ourselves and collaborating more effectively as leaders within our organizations. Um, And so we'd love to, if anybody has any questions on social, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn or Instagram. Jake Thompson Speaks is my handle. And man, if anything Eric and I talked about today, you're like, I got a question on this or how would you handle this? Shoot me a note. We'd love to dive further because as Eric said, man, we could talk all day on this kind of stuff. It it brings me joy. If we can talk this and sports all day, I'm good. (laughs) Right on. Well, Jake, I really appreciate you coming on and we'll have all the links in the show notes to Jake's website so you can uh, get in touch with him. And um, I do wish you the best. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Jake. Feel free to check out his website. Links in the show notes. Contact him on LinkedIn and let him know that you found him through Construction Genius. And also, share this interview with other people that you think would benefit from listening. And finally, this is a big one right here. Give the show a rating and a review on Apple and on Google, and on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening today. Catch you on the next episode. 